Good evening, everyone. Um, great to see you all. Welcome uh, to Chirp Nature Center. Uh, if I haven't met you before, I'm Randy Putz. I'm uh, the owner along with my wife, uh, Beth Wheat. We've been doing uh, these free uh, nature talks. This is our fourth year uh, that we have been offering these uh, to the community. And it is our uh, privilege to do this. And our goal, uh, quite simply, is to connect people to nature using wild birds as inspiration. So without further ado, I would like to introduce a good friend of Chirps, Matthew Schreiner, who's going to talk to us about birds in your backyard. Matthew. All right. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with you all tonight. Uh, some familiar faces uh, from some of the bird walks. Uh, I try to, to join as often as I can uh, to share what I know about birds. And uh, a lot of what I know about birds is uh, just from experience. Um, uh, I have a little page here, just a little bit about me. Uh, but I, this celebrates my 30th year birding this year. Uh, I started bird watching when I was a sophomore in college. Uh, I worked at a nature reserve. Uh, our uh, director was an ornithologist and said, hey, like, why don't you come out and meet me at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning and let's look at some birds. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's really early on a Saturday morning. Uh, but it got me hooked. And uh, I have uh, been bird watching 30 years now. Um, I've worked on a number of research projects. So uh, I worked on the California Gnat Catcher Project. So if any, anybody's aware of the coastal California, uh, sage, uh, coastal sage scrub, uh, it's a very unique uh, environment that these little birds that are probably no bigger than, you know, about this big, uh, that, that's their entire habitat. And they will only breed and live uh, in coastal sage scrub. Uh, and so we were um, looking at it because there was a huge expansion in California along the coast uh, in the mid to early 90s. And, and so there wasn't enough research done at that point uh, to really understand what the impact was. So um, I worked with uh, the Metropolitan Water District and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, um, you know, we, we really spent, uh, geez, two or three years uh, researching almost every day in the field, uh, what was going on with these little guys and where they were moving and how many successful nests they could have and how many pairs there were and uh, lots of great information. Um, uh, later in college, uh, I actually came back up here to Big Bear uh, for a map station um, and maps is monitoring avian productivity and survival. Um, the great thing about birds is they have a long memory. Uh, and they will migrate through the same meadow year after year. Uh, they have put it in their brain as they move south or north for that much, uh, what it is and where they were uh, successfully feeding, where there was an environment um, that was beneficial to them. Uh, and so we would miss net, we'd put nets up uh, starting a half hour before sunrise, so even earlier than that 6 a.m. time. Uh, to, uh, to really understand uh, how, how many years birds were surviving, uh, were they, uh, how many new birds, because um, birds in their skulls, um, they develop over a period of time. When a, when a chick is hatched, their skull is not fully formed. Um, they, you can tell by looking under uh, a magnifying glass uh, if it's a first year bird. So if that bird was hatched that year. So um, lots of interesting information. And, and we were right up here at Bluff Lake and Metcalf Meadow. So um, there's been some research right in our own backyard uh, here in the Big Bear Valley. And uh, uh, that, that project ran for a number of years um, and uh, gave some great information for species and, and looking at protections. Um, and, and it really comes down as we go through this um, you know, we are part of the ecosystem, but we can't be the only part. Um, and I think that's why I'm so passionate about sharing my information that I've learned over the years um, with everybody, because we have to share the environment uh, with all of these great other things, these other beings that are out there. And um, it, it's, it's always uh, a mystery. You never know what you're going to see when you go out. Uh, which makes it even more fun because uh, it's a, a new and different experience each time. 
Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what's in our backyards here in Big Bear. Um, and uh, we're gonna start a little bit um, with a little bit of information kind of more uh, on a global level. Uh, because I think it's important to understand where birds go and why we see certain birds at certain times of the year um, and what we should expect certain times of the year because not all of the birds that we're seeing today um, are gonna be here year round. Um, actually, very few of them will be here in the dead of winter. So we're, we're in a, a very unique kind of alpine uh, pine forest, we have some riparian, so willow trees are birds' favorites. If you have a willow tree, please never cut it down. Uh, birds, uh, especially warblers, love willow trees. It's really important uh, to their survival because there's a lot of uh, bugs and insects that live within willows uh, that feed these birds in their, uh, in their migration periods. Um, then we have um, beautiful meadows, um, so things like, uh, oops, <laughs> things like fox sparrows and Lincoln sparrows and um, some of those birds actually nest in the meadows themselves. Um, so if you're going to go out and you're going to go trompsing through a meadow, um, just keep your eyes out because uh, there are birds that have little uh, nests right on the ground, right in the middle of a meadow. And then of course, on the back of Big Bear Valley, uh, we kind of have that high desert transition. So we're in a little bit more uh, drier, arid, and we actually have a whole s different set of birds that prefer that, that are not necessarily on the west end. Um, and so it's, it's a great contrast to see uh, what is out in that high desert area uh, versus what is here uh, in the pine riparian forest. Oops, flying all over the place here. <laughs> All right, so um, as, we, as we all know, birds migrate. Um, and some birds migrate extremely long distances. So they'll go from uh, Alaska all the way down to Chile and Argentina every year. This is their cycle. They come, they come through in spring, they nest up in uh, Northern Territory of Canada, Alaska. Uh, they successfully raise their young. And then once the young are on their own and the temperatures start to cool a little bit, the days get a little bit shorter, they start that trek south. And it takes them months to go south. Um, there's a lot of research being done today on nighttime bird chirps. So when birds migrate, they actually have a different chirp at night when they migrate. So there's listening stations kind of all throughout the US and they're expanding it into South America to, to really understand when the birds are coming through um, and what kind of volumes. Uh, in some instances, they actually are picked up on radar. So radar is picking them up uh, as they're migrating south, which is really interesting. But we're in the Pacific Flyway. Um, and what that means for us is the San Bernardino Mountains kind of work as that conduit south for a lot of birds, um, warblers. It's cooler up here. Um, there's a lot more food because there's more insects up here. Um, they're not gonna probably survive in downtown LA. There's, there's not enough food, there's not enough uh, you know, habitat for them to be successful. So they, they travel down the Sierra Nevadas, they come through the San Bernardinos, they cross over into the San Jacintos, and they work their way down by Salton Sea and kind of down through Mexico. Um, and so we're in this really important flyway. Um, and so birds come north in the springtime and they go south uh, in the fall. Well, our fall is a little early up here because they have such a long distance to go. So for warblers, um, we should start to see um, that southern migration uh, starting in August. Um, and uh, we have hundreds a day coming through some of the meadows. Uh, when we were bird banding at our map station uh, in Bluff Lake, we would band 300 warblers in a single day. Um, and they're just feeding and moving south. Um, and they stop long enough to refuel uh, because they don't really have big fat reserves. Um, so what they eat, they burn off right away, unlike us. <laughs> so what are birds looking for? And I think this is really important, um, especially as we talk about what's in our backyard, because um, whether it's your backyard or it's the meadow down the street, they're still looking for some similar 
attributes. And, and one of those is a food source. They need food. Um, when it gets cold at night, they can burn through all of their fat in one night just to keep themselves warm. So they have to replenish every day. Uh, which is really important. So they need to make sure that they have a steady food source. And what I would say is, um, if you're feeding the birds in your backyard, um, do it on a consistent basis. Don't do it one time and then never do it again because you probably won't see a lot of birds in your backyard. But if you're consistent about it, you're gonna have more regulars, you're gonna have things that um, you're gonna see, you're gonna probably see more variety because word has gotten out that you're the house to come to on your block. They're also looking for water. It's been really dry in California. Um, there's not as much water available in general um, for birds, and birds like us will drink water. So they're gonna find water sources. Now, there are a number of springs throughout the valley here, um, but not all of them are easily accessible. Uh, so if you have water in your backyard, and if you have water that uh, is making a sound, uh, so dripping water, uh, waterfall, fountain, um, it draws them even in even more. And then of course, birds need shelter. Uh, when storms come through, uh, you know, a piece of hail to us may hurt, but it could kill a bird uh, because you know, they're so small and tiny and fragile. So they're looking for places to roost uh, in trees, under eaves, under decks. Um, all of those things, they roost every night and, and they find favorite places. And so I would encourage you, um, you know, if you have places that are protected, uh, like trees and things like that, you know, if you don't have to remove them, don't. Um, dead branches are not a bad thing. Uh, it is a roosting spot for somebody. Um, so when we talk about food, obviously native plants, number one, right? That is what birds uh, prefer. And, it, and it's not the introduced plants that we buy at the nursery that look really pretty. We need to be looking at things that occur naturally. Um, so things that have berries, they have a berry and there's probably a bird that's going to eat those berries at some point throughout the year. Um, so it's really important if we have the ability, whether it be up here in Big Bear or down the hill somewhere, um, the native plants are, are the number one thing that we should be planting in our yards uh, because it's helping the environment overall because these birds are gonna go to the natural food sources first uh, because it's what, what they're programmed to do. Um, they're gonna come to feeders second uh, because uh, it's gonna augment what they already uh, know that they can eat. So not all feeders feed all birds. Um, that's a important distinction. Uh, you can hang one feeder up and then talk to a neighbor next door that has a different type of feeder and they're getting a whole different bird because not all birds like the same type of feeder. Um, and we're gonna talk about that when we go into the information about uh, the different birds that are in our areas. Um, I've actually kind of called out on those slides what they prefer. Um, so the common birds that we're seeing, I'm gonna tell you what they prefer um, versus what you may have in your yard. So if you're looking to attract a certain type of bird, you may need to evaluate what feeders you have um, to get that bird to come into your yard. Um, now, sometimes they'll naturally come in because you have the right vegetation, your house was built within the trees and the woodpeckers love the trees, so you're good to go. Uh, but if you're wanting spotted toeys or um, uh, black-headed grosbeaks, uh, you probably need a little bit something different um, because although they're gonna nest in those trees, uh, that's not their food source. Um, so they're gonna wanna feed somewhere differently. Um, water, so whether you have a water bowl, um, I have a, a deck bowl um, that attaches to, to the railing of my back deck and that's how we have water at our house. Um, or you have a fountain. Um, birds, the sound of running water for birds is, is kind of music to their ears. They're, they're going to be attracted to it. Um, and so I kind of look in, in this first one with the, uh, the goldfinch, um, you know, something simple. You don't need a pond to attract birds. And actually you don't want necessarily a pond because birds can drown. They don't swim for the most part. Um, and you don't want deep water. 
uh, one, two inches max um, is all that they want. So if you ever watch a bird along the shore, they're just going to get their feet in, maybe, just enough to drink. They're not going to go wading in, unless it's a wading bird. Uh, but uh, So if, if you have a deeper water source, put some rocks in it. They're going to land on the rocks, and they're going to use that to bathe or uh, as a stepping point. Um, so um, for shelter, uh, you know, I always encourage put a couple of birdhouses in your yard um, if you're interested. Um, it's a great place. They'll roost in them sometimes. Um, so chickadees roost by themselves every night. They actually do not roost as a family unit. Uh, so they, everybody's looking for a place um, to roost. And our mountain chickadees never go anywhere. They stay here year round. So when that snowstorm's coming through, a birdhouse is a great place for them to escape to, um, to stay warm overnight and, uh, and not freeze. Um, so consider putting a birdhouse up in your backyard if, if possible. Um, you know, they're going to naturally go to trees and, and other vegetation. That's just the way it was before there were people. There were not buildings. Uh, so <laughs> that's where they go naturally. But, um, you know, we cut a lot of that down uh, just to make our lives easier. So we need to augment the things that we've cut down and the things that we've taken away uh, with other sources. And of course, they'll, we, we all have a woodpecker banging on the side of our house at 5.30 in the morning when the sun comes up or on the chimney to make the sound if you have a metal chimney stack. Um, you know, it, it happens, uh, not the end of the world. Generally speaking, they're not gonna do too much damage to your house, but uh, you know, it's, a lot of times they're just looking to go under something um, or they're looking for bugs to feed on. Okay, so I wanted to spend a few minutes. Um, this is the like hi highly educational part of tonight. Um, I, I won't go into super detail, but um, I think it's really important to understand um, that birds molt. Um, and by what I mean by molt is they change their feathers out on a regular basis. Um, so it's naturally uh, occurring for birds to drop feathers. Uh, and it is a very taxing process for birds to drop feathers because they're regrowing those feathers. Um, and it takes a lot of energy in their body to do that. Um, and so I, I wanted to include this because um, a lot of times you see in illustration books that, oh my gosh, look at how pretty that bird is. And then you go in your backyard and you're like, oh, it doesn't quite look like that. Mine looks a little different. It's kind of dull and kind of plain. Um, because that's, the reason is there's breeding plumage. So they look all bright and glowy when they want to breed. Like people, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're going to put your best outfit on and take the shower before you go out at night. Um, and birds are kind of doing that same thing. Um, and uh, so there's, there's different birds have different cycles when it comes to, uh, to molting. And so we're going to talk really briefly about that. Um, so there are a lot of birds that just do one molt per year. Um, hummingbirds fall into that category. And so this is an Anna's hummingbird male. Um, and as you're going to see at the top, so this is going to be a first year male. So this one is going to be born. It's going to get some of its iridescent feathers around the neck not really a mature, like, finished picture, right? Like, we're looking to see that bottom picture, that, that male that has gone through his molt and looks fantastic, and the sun hits it just right, and it just glows. That is a bird that has gone through a molt. So they've actually lost all those first-year feathers, and they've replaced them with their adult feathers. And so it's usually that second year, that second time that they're going through uh, that molt is when they get those really spectacular colors. Then there's another group of birds um, that do like a one and a half molt a year. Um, and that's because they need to put those pretty feathers on uh, in order to attract that mate. Um, and so this is the western tanager. Um, it's up here in the mountains in the San Bernardinos. You can see it uh, out in the field. Um, the top picture is what it looks like in non-breeding season. So uh, basically about this time of year, all the way through February, March. Um, doesn't have the red head. It's just kind of all yellow black with a little bit of white. Uh, when it comes breeding time, 
Let's get that red going on. So it just molts that head portion uh, in order to get the color uh, to attract a mate. Um, so there's a, another group of birds that kind of just do a little partial molt just to clean things up, uh, you know, right before breeding season. And then there's a few birds that molt twice a year. Um, and they are molting everything. You know what? We spend a lot of time in the bushes, a lot of time uh, in swampy areas, probably get a lot of bird da uh, feather damage. They're just going to molt them and be done and start over. Um, and so this is a marsh wren. Um, we do get this in Vaughn's Marsh. We've had it there um, in the past, um, and hopefully we'll have it again this summer. Um, and uh, they're kind of in the reeds, and they, their feet kind of grab two reeds, and you just see them bobbing around kind of in the, in the, in the vegetation. Uh, but, but they'll molt twice in a year, um, which is quite taxing uh, because they've got to regrow all those feathers all over again. Um, and they really kind of look kind of interesting right in the middle of a molt. They kind of just look all disheveled and they've got feathers kind of growing in and when they flap their wings, they're missing a whole bunch. And um, so they're quite the sight uh, when they're going through that process. Uh, so it's, it's generally non-breeding season that they're doing that. So they'll do that before they migrate in the fall and they'll do it again before uh, breeding season because uh, during breeding season, uh, the chicks are going to take all of their time, effort, uh, and energy uh, during that period. So what are you likely to see in your backyard? Um, so we're going to go through, and these are all of the things that, um, uh, looking at all the birds that we have here in the San Bernardino Mountains, these are the things that you're likely to see at your bird feeders or just in your backyard um, if you have vegetation. So we're going to start out with some hawks. Um, generally, you're thinking, well, I don't know that I would have a hawk in my backyard. That doesn't seem too logical. Do you have chipmunks or ground squirrels? During COVID, we were sitting in the back, sitting in our, in our living room, and all of a sudden, we heard a bunch of commotion in the backyard. A red-tailed hawk swooped down and got a ground squirrel right in our backyard. We're like, oh my gosh, like, this was unexpected. We kind of felt bad for the ground squirrel because you know, we're feed, they're feeding off of the bird seed and everything else, and this hawk just recognized that and said, oh, I've got lunch. Uh, so the, the, middle, the middle bird here is the red-tailed hawk. Um, the bird uh, on the left is the red-shouldered hawk. Um, and so uh, I guess it was last year we were doing the, the Happy Trails walk. Um, the red-shouldered hawk um, likes neighborhoods. Um, they like the trees, they like the riparian areas, um, and they're gonna be darting through the trees um, at really fast speeds, and they're gonna get whatever they can. Whatever's moving, whether it be another bird or an animal, they're gonna get it. Uh, and then the bird on the right um, is a Cooper's hawk. Um, and now Cooper's hawk are notorious uh, for eating other birds. That's uh, their primary uh, uh, delicatessen on the menu. Uh, and, and so if you have two things happen, you know you probably should be looking around your backyard for a Cooper's Hawk. If you have everything chirping, everything's making a lot of noise, and then all of a sudden it goes dead silent. That's when you're like, okay, is there a hawk somewhere out here? Uh, because um, they either, they have two instincts. And if you have bushes, a lot of times the birds will go in the bushes and then they'll just start calling. They'll be making a ton of racket. That's your other key. Um, if everything all of a sudden starts to sing, they're hidden, but they're singing. There's probably a Cooper's Hawk somewhere near where you're at. Uh, so, uh, you know, they happen. They're, they're out there. Um, we have Cooper's Hawks all over. Um, all over Southern California, not just up here in the mountains, uh, but down below as well. And uh, so, you know, just a, a, little, a little note, if everything goes crazy or everything goes silent, you probably got a hawk somewhere near uh, your bird feeders. All right, we're gonna talk uh, about pigeons and doves. Um, so tonight we've actually had some band-tailed pigeons, um, which are on the far right here. Um, the band-tailed pigeons uh, are kind of uh, our mountain or our 
forest species um, that occur naturally, um, and they're quite large. Uh, you're going to know if you have one at your feeder, they're going to be, oh, I don't know, somewhere about this big. Uh, they're, they're quite hefty, um, and they're pretty common up here. Um, they will normally come down in the afternoon, even the evening time, to take a little snack at your feeder. Uh, we've had some here tonight in the, uh, the trees behind us. Um, they pop around. Um, really cool birds. Um, and, uh, you know, not the rock pigeon that you're going to find in the city uh, or even in downtown Big Bear because they do pop up um, every now and then. Um, the rock pigeon was an introduced species uh, and uh, you can find it all over the world for the most part. Uh, it, it kind of rings European when you think about it because uh, lots of commercials have the pigeons flying off as somebody goes through a town square. Uh, and so that's what, uh, that's what we have here as well, same species. Um, the bird on the left is the European collared dove, um, another introduced species um, to us, not native to the area, but their range has been expanding for years um, and they've made it all the way to Big Bear. Uh, they're here. When they take off, they make their cooing sound. And when they land, they make a cooing sound. So they kind of give themselves away. But you, you don't even have to have your binoculars. If you hear them flapping and they're cooing, it's a Eurasian collared dove. Um, and then, of course, uh, the bird uh, next to uh, our band-tailed pigeon is our mourning dove. Um, really common. Probably the laziest nesting bird you'll ever meet. Uh, they will literally throw a few sticks in a pot on your front porch and lay a clutch of 12 eggs. Yep, and that's all they do. They're done. Uh, I have seen nests in random places that you're like, well, are you gonna finish it? Like, there's just a couple of sticks and then all these eggs. Nope, they're done. Uh, nesting is, they lay so many eggs um, that uh, if they lose a few, it's no big deal because they've made it up in volume uh, and that's how they survive. Kind of different. So our, our pigeons and doves uh, like to feed on the ground or they like to feed on a platform. Uh, they generally will not go to a vertical column feeder. Uh, they're too big and they can't hold on. Um, you know, the, the birds that are going to those column feeders are, you know, maybe two or three inches wide versus a dove or a pigeon that's five or six inches wide. They're just not made. Uh, so if you have seed on the ground or you throw seed out on the ground, uh, on the railing of your deck, things like that, that's when you're going to get your morning doves and your band-tailed pigeons and things like that. Um, so uh, just an opportunity. Everybody's favorite are hummingbirds. Um, they're super cool. Uh, the only bird that can fly backwards uh, is the hummingbird. Uh, and uh, if you've ever watched one, I mean, they're just an acrobatic marvel uh, in, in, their, in their flying ability. Um, our most common uh, is uh, the Anna's hummingbird with the pink gor gorget under and above the males that are uh, you know, multi-year uh, males. Um, the female does not have any of that pink color. She's pretty much all green and white. Um, they, they nest up here, so we, we do get them. Um, they are looking for the bright flowers in the fields. Uh, so the pinstamens and the paintbrush, the Indian paintbrush and things like that. Um, that's what they're going to feed on. They're also going to come to your feeder. Um, and uh, so feeders are great for hummingbirds. Um, it gives you an opportunity to see them up close. Um, generally not too bothered by people. Um, hummingbirds will come in with you a five or six feet uh, away. Um, my one piece of caution is hummingbirds are known to stay with the food source. Um, when it snows up here, poor little hummingbirds have to stay warm all night. And that's a challenge for them. Uh, and people leave feeders up well into the snow season. Um, which isn't great for hummingbirds because their only source of food is your feeder. There's nothing else blooming because everything's covered in snow. Um, and so my, my word of caution is um, enjoy them in the summer, 
but let them migrate. Let them go down the hill for the winter because it's really hard to survive up here, especially if you go on vacation and you don't have your feeders filled. Uh, that could be a treacherous uh, proposition to go down the hill at that point. Um, so typically, November 1st is a great time to take down your hummingbird feeders. Um, and then the springtime, sometime March, April, is a great time to put them up. Um, don't worry, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna go through. There's some natural flowers blooming already for them. They're gonna be in the area and they'll find your food source. They'll remember where you live uh, and they'll come back for your feeder. But just be cautious uh, in that winter time that you don't leave feeders up too long. Um, the Allen's hummingbird is the one in the middle. And this is kind of a newer uh, hummingbird here in Southern California. Um, they have kind of like this copper gold kind of color gorget. Um, they look a lot like a rufous hummingbird, um, which I don't have on the slide because they only come through during migration. Our, our rufous hummingbirds nest further north than where we're at. Um, but they do come through in migration. We do get them up in Bluff Lake. Um, but the difference between the Allens and the rufous is the rufous is all that kind of rust copper color. They don't have any green. And you'll notice that this Allen's kind of has that little bit of green tint on the back and the head. Um, and so that's kind of a, a great differentiation between the two species. Um, the Allen's are now here probably to stay. They're expanding north um, in, uh, in Orange County and LA County. They've actually kind of outcompeted the Anna's hummingbirds for territory. Uh, because they're eating all of the same kind of foods. And then the last one here uh, that I included is the black chin hummingbird. So anybody that lives on the east side of the valley, um, kind of in the drier, a little bit more arid, kind of deserty, um, the black chin, uh, it actually looks black, but it has a little purple on the bottom. They're a little bit smaller than the, the Anna's hummingbird, but about the same size as the Allen's. Um, and these are kind of a, a desert species that will frequent kind of the fringes of the valley here. Um, and uh, they're really cool to look at. Um, you have to get the light just right because all hummingbirds, if you see them without direct sunlight, they're all just going to be that green kind of plain color. It's the, the, the reflection of the light on those feathers that are creating the colors themselves. Um, and so um, you really need that sunlight to see those colors. Now, we do get the rufous and we get the calliope hummingbirds up here, um, but they're not as reliable in our backyards. Um, they're generally somewhere in a meadow um, where there's lots of natural food sources. Um, they're not known to be uh, associated with, uh, with, with hummingbird feeders themselves. All right, so woodpeckers, everybody's favorite. Uh, they're really cool. Um, they can get you up really in, early in the morning sometimes. Um, the hairy woodpecker on the left is kind of that kind of more typical what you would expect a woodpecker to be. Um, they're black and white striped. Um, the males have red on the back of the head um, and the females do not. Um, so that is one way uh, to tell them apart. Um, just by their plumage. Now, the middle is the acorn woodpecker. So if you have any black oak trees around your house, uh, you probably hear these every morning, every night, and sometime in between. Uh, they are very noisy. Um, they are very family oriented though. Um, it's been known for the young from the previous year to help raise their siblings the next year. Um, they do it as a family unit. Um, the acorn woodpeckers like the oak trees. That's what they're specifically looking for. So anywhere that you have the black oak up here in the, in the mountains, you're gonna probably find the acorn woodpeckers. Um, and this was the original inspiration for Woody Woodpecker, uh, was the acorn woodpecker. Um, the artist that drew it lived in Topanga Canyon, which has a lot of oak trees. Uh, and they were going crazy outside his window and was driving him nuts. And that's where Woody Woodpecker originated. Now, the white-headed woodpecker, uh, the last one here on this slide, um, the white-headed woodpeckers are more about where you live um, here in the valley. If you live on the fringe of the forest, you're more likely uh, to get the white-headed woodpecker than necessarily here in town. 
Um, just a, a habitat type thing. They're looking for the bigger trees. Um, they're looking for the less disturbed areas, um, generally speaking. Now, uh, woodpeckers like sunflower seeds. They like suet. Uh, and they'll even actually go after peanuts if you have them out. They'll fight the jays for them, but they'll get some. In that same woodpecker family, we have our northern flicker. And uh, I, I do have some flicker feathers. Um, we have the orange or the red shafted flickers, which are really orange. Um, and there is a desert species that is yellow shafted. Um, so this bird comes in two varieties. Um, we have the orange red variety here in the mountains. Um, these guys you'll generally find uh, feeding on the ground, ironically. They're going for the worms and the bugs on the ground. Uh, but you'll also see them in the trees. They'll go for your suet. Absolutely love suet. Um, but generally will stay away from your feeders. They're, they're not huge feeder uh, birds. Um, the next two are sap suckers. Um, and these you'll find typically more associated uh, with the willow trees, believe it or not. Um, they are looking to uh, peck holes in the bark of the willow that will create a little bit of sap that will then trap bugs that they can come back and eat. Um, so you'll see little uh, tracks of, of little pecked holes in the, uh, uh, the bark of willow trees. And you kind of have to look in the middle generally. Uh, but, uh, but you'll find them. And they're just there to uh, be an optimistic uh, you know, to go out there and, and get those bugs as they come through. Um, the the red-breasted sapsucker, we have quite a few here. They will come into your feeders, and they will come into suet feeders. Um, and uh, they'll pop in every now and then. All right, everybody's favorite, probably the noisiest birds that we have, are our jays. Um, depending on where you live in the valley will depend on what type of jays that you get. And it really is specific to uh, the type of vegetation that you have. So um, if you don't have a lot of trees, um, you're probably going to have the California uh, scrub jay. Um, and that is the second bird in on this picture. Um, scrub jays uh, naturally occur kind of all throughout Southern California. Um, they're not quite as noisy as the Stellar's jays. Uh, that are on the far right of this slide. Um, and the Stellar's Jays love peanuts. Uh, if you have peanuts, um, even the Scrub Jays love peanuts. And there's been lots of uh, records of people that have put peanuts out and sat on their deck when they put them out, and the bird gets used to them. They move it a little bit closer to them each time until they're feeding them out of their hand. Um, and that's very typical of Scrub Jays, and, and it happens quite frequently. Uh, the third bird in there is, this, is the pinion jay. Uh, now, the pinion jay uh, is something that you find kind of on that little bit more deserty. So if you're over at Lake Irwin, Bald Baldwin, that kind of that east side of the valley, um, you're going to have the pinion jays uh, more so than uh, probably the stellars or the scrub jays. Um, and they come through, and they're quite noisy, and they're usually um, in a group. Um, they're usually not by themselves. Uh, so all the jays, sunflower seeds, corn, if you put corn out, the dried corn on the cob, just put it on your deck table. You'll see them. They'll come. They'll fill up their gullet with, with uh, kernels of corn. They'll just sit and peck at it until they've filled up, and they'll fly off and hide it somewhere. They'll take the peanuts, and you'll be cleaning your yard or your planters out in a week or two, and guess what? You're going to find those peanuts buried because they bury them everywhere and don't remember where they put them. So, um, oh, the last one is the Clark's Nutcracker. And this one, again, is all about where you live. So if you're in Moon Ridge, Sugarloaf, um, or kind of on the fringe here, um, you're likely to have the Clark's Nutcracker. Um, and they're very loud. They, they squawk all the time. Uh, and they look a little bit different than the rest. So uh, they have no blue easy way to identify them uh, separate from uh, the other jays that we have here. Of course, everybody knows our mountain chickadee. Uh, they're probably our favorite uh, here year round. Uh, they survive the cold winters. They make it and are ready to go. They don't migrate 
uh, they're, they're here for, for the long haul. Uh, and good for them. Uh, but they need the seeds and pine cones to survive. Uh, so that's why it's always great to let them be. Um, unless you really have to have a reason to take those pine cones away, let them sit, let them be, because those chickadees are going to come back through uh, when it gets really cold <laughs> and look for those seeds, because that's what they're, that's what's going to get them through that summertime. I mean that winter time. The nut hatches are also kind of high energy. Um, generally speaking, uh, they are kind of bopping all around all the time. They don't sit still, kind of like a little kid, like boom, 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 next. Um, the pygmy nut hatches, which are on the left here, um, the pygmy nut hatches usually will come in a family unit. Um, when you see one, you usually see five, six, seven, eight, 10, 15. Uh, and they have this really bubbly little sound that they make. Um, and they all just kind of come together. Um, it's a great like little experience uh, in your own backyard. Um, they'll come for the suet. They'll come for seeds. They like the sunflower seeds as well. Um, but they like the suet just equally as much. Uh, and uh, just lots of fun. They're all over the valley. Uh, I don't know of any place that I haven't seen them here. Um, and uh, they're really cute too. They kind of have like this slate gray back to them. Uh, the middle is the, the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, and they literally have white on the sides of their face and the gray comes down the middle. So if you're looking at them kind of directly on, they're going to have white cheek marks, but gray in the middle. Um, probably the white breasted is the one that you're most familiar with the sound. Um, and, uh, and they're pretty much all over the valley as well. The last one is the red breasted nuthatch. And I feel like those are more on the west side of the valley. We don't seem to get them out on the east side quite as much uh, because they do like the pine forest more than anything else. Um, so if you're up at Bluff Lake, you're probably likely uh, in that area to see a red-breasted uh, uh, nuthatch. And if you're kind of on the fringe here, so if you're in, in uh, along the forest, uh, they're likely to come down to your backyard um, to say hi. Okay, our thrushes. Now, um, these generally uh, are, are robins. Um, you, you'll usually see them around your yard. Um, we haven't quite figured out where the robins go because they're not here all summer. They nest, then they disappear for a little while, and they come back. Um, nobody's been able to track where they're going, but they are leaving the general area of Big Bear for a couple of weeks, a month, um, and then they're coming back, and, and we don't know quite yet where they go. Um, so that is a future science project for anybody that's interested. Um, of course, uh, Chirp is based on the Western Bluebird, um, and that is our bird here in the middle. Um, and they are insect eaters. They're not so much interested in uh, the seed that we have. They're more interested in worms and, and insects and things like that. So. Um, if you have millworms, uh, if you put them out, even if they're dried, they'll come in to a feeder to eat that. But you want to put them on a platform feeder. Uh, you don't want to put them on a vertical feeder. And then the last one is the Townsend Solitaire. Um, and uh, we live in Sugarloaf, and they're all over. They, they have a great, uh, a great song that they sing. Um, but they're not going to come to the feeders they're gonna come for the vegetation. So if you have juniper berries in your yard, you're likely to have one of these come in to eat the juniper berries. Um, and that's what they prefer. Um, and they're, they're really not kind of that seed kind of uh, species here uh, that will take advantage of that. All right, so now we're moving on to towies and sparrows. Um, and these are generally ground feeders uh, or platform feeders. Um, so the sparrows, generally you'll see on the ground, um, and that's where they like to feed. Uh, seeds naturally fall off of plants, and they go to the ground. That's where they forage. Uh, and so kind of the same way. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna put feed out, just take a handful and throw it on the ground. Um, they're likely to come in and feed on it. Um, the one thing I will say about sparrows is they don't like big open spaces, generally speaking. They like a place that they can easily scurry off to and hide if there's that Cooper's Hawk 
somewhere sitting in the yard. They want to be able to get away quickly. Um, so if you've cleared everything in your yard, um, you're probably not as likely to have some of the sparrows in your yard. They do need a little bit of low brush uh, in order to, uh, to feel comfortable. Um, some people have brush piles and things like that, wood piles. Um, they're likely to kind of duck under there or duck in there um, as, they, as they go. All right, so this is probably one of our prettier birds that we have. Um, this is the black-headed grosbeak. Um, look at the size of that bill. <laughs> uh, really large bill. Uh, and so they're looking for the sunflower seeds. That's what they're coming in for. They're looking for the seeds, the larger seeds. Um, and they will come to platform feeders um, or uh, flat feeders. Um, if you have a tray at the bottom of your feeder, that'll work. Um, but they're not generally going to, once again, stand on that little peg uh, that's outside of one of the column feeders. Um, these uh, black-headed grosbeaks have a really pretty song. Uh, so I'd encourage you uh, to, to go out to uh, iBird or eBird or uh, All About Birds um, and listen to their song. It's, it's really quite spectacular, and it's kind of one of the, the nicer ones that we get to hear uh, in the valley. Uh, the, the two birds on this slide on the, on the outside, the two outside birds, those are both males. Um, the one in the middle is the female or the juvenile. So the first year bird, so if it hatched earlier this year, um, it's going to look like the female. It's going to look like that middle bird. And then it's going to molt right before uh, springtime next year. And it's going, if it's a male, it's going to look like one of those outer uh, pictures here. All right, finches. I think everybody's seen a finch at some point in their life. Uh, the, <laughs> these are pretty common everywhere in Southern California. Um, of course, our most common is the house finch, which is on the left. Um, we have the unique opportunity to see purple and Cassin's finches uh, up here in the Big Bear Valley. And the purple finch is in the middle, and the Cassin's finch is on the right. Um, they are sometimes hard to differentiate just by sight. So um, you want to listen to their song. You want to listen to what they're singing. Um, and that makes it a little easier to tell them apart. Now, I know learning a thousand bird songs is probably not at the top of everybody's list. Um, so there's an app called Merlin. And if you just open, it's a free app from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. If you just open the app on your phone and hit listen, it will listen to the birds around you. And it does a pretty darn good job of identifying those songs and those birds. Um, so a little shortcut um, if, if you don't want to learn all those bird songs. Um, they will come to sunflower seeds and feeders. Um, they will come to the column feeders. Um, they're pretty, they're pretty not, not picky at all. If there's seed, they're going to eat it, whether it's on the ground or in, in a feeder itself. And of course, our, our little yellow ones that everybody sees throughout the valley, and that's our lesser goldfinches. Um, the, uh, the one in the middle is the full adult male. Uh, the one on the right is uh, a male that has just started to molt and hasn't gotten quite all of its black cap yet. Um, and the one on the left is either a juvenile uh, or a female. Um, and so um, as they go through their molt, their second or their first year molt, um, if it is a male, it will start to get that male coloring. Um, they all kind of go drab in the fall. So they're all going to kind of look just kind of yellow. <laughs> Uh, but um, they're going to come to a thistle feeder or uh, uh, a long feeder, that something that they can grab onto. Um, sometimes you uh, can go to the, the, the store and get a sock that they fill with thistle. Um, I know Randy has th uh, thistle feeders themselves, Niger thistle feeders. Um, and that's primarily what they prefer. Uh, we have a, a special feeder just for them. Um, there are a ton of them here in the valley. Um, and uh, they're just really cute, and, and they have a really cool little uh, sound to them. All right, we're going to spend just a couple of minutes and talk about migrating birds. So we're in that flyway that we talked about earlier in the program. Uh, we're in that Pacific flyway. So we have birds that are going to stop by on their way north, and they're going to stop by on their way south. Um, and I've pulled out just a few um, that I think are worth watching for. Um, at your feeders uh, in your backyard. 
The first is the evening grows beak. Uh, I think it was, it was 2020 COVID. We had just decided that we were going to stay at our house up here full time. Uh, and uh, so I had a lot of time to look at bird feeders. Uh, and one day I'm like, wait, I haven't seen this bird here before. What is this? Uh, so I got my camera out and I'm like, okay, I got to figure out what this is. Um, and we had evening grosbeaks that came through in late March, early April, uh, and pretty spectacular. They don't nest here. They don't stay here. They're literally stopping over on their way north. Um, and, uh, and so the male is on the top, the female's on the bottom. They have that giant beak uh, that you probably don't want to get your fingers too close to because they'll probably hurt. Uh, but, uh, but they're there for the sunflower seeds. Um, and that's all they're going to eat at your feeders. Uh, but, uh, but they do come through here, and I think they're pretty cool. And you're not likely to see them any other time of the year um, at any other place. Um, they are literally stopping by on their way north. Um, and we don't typically seem to get them in the fall either, so they're flying right over us as they're going south um, for whatever reason. We, we just don't have enough data yet. These guys always are a crowd pleaser. They're really cool looking. Um, these are the cedar wax wings. We get them up here. They do come through. Um, they're also in pretty decent numbers uh, down the hill in the wintertime. Um, so they, they were kind of on the northern end of their range uh, in the wintertime. So they will hang around Southern California just because it doesn't generally get too cold in LA County, Orange County, San Diego County. It's warm enough that they can survive the winter time. Um, and there's enough food. They like berries. They primarily only eat berries. Um, so if you have something that produces a berry, they're going to stop by and, and have a little, little lunch. Um, we, uh, we do get them um, in the spring and the fall here in the valley. Um, and uh, I know, Allie, if you're, if you're not a member on Facebook of... Uh, Big Bear Birding. Uh, I know that there is um, uh, a lady that lives uh, kind of in uh, fawn skin that does a lot of posts, um, and she had a bunch of them uh, at a water source uh, that were just kind of getting a little bit of water, kind of hanging out for a few days uh, before they moved on. Um, but these are ones worth getting a good look at because from a distance, you may not actually pick up on everything, but they do have yellow tips on the tail, and they do have really cool kind of red uh, tips on the wings. Um, so things that you may not see at a glance, but if you take a second to really focus on them, they're actually very pretty, very spectacular birds. And I couldn't not put the white crown sparrows in. Um, white crown sparrows are probably the most abundant uh, sparrow that we get in Southern California um, in the wintertime. Um, and for us up here, it's more about spring and fall migration that we get the white crown sparrows. Um, but they nest all the way up in Canada and Alaska. Um, and um, the really cool thing about these, they have a beautiful song. So you know when they've come in, they've got a very unique kind of distinct song that is different from everything else that would be in your backyard. Um, but you can tell the age of the bird, whether it's a juvenile or an adult, just by the color of their feathers. So if you look at the top photo, see how it's brown with a little bit of white and then a little bit more brown? That's a juvenile. That's a first year bird. All first year white crown sparrows have brown in their crown. When they go through that first molt, it turns to black. And so you immediately can tell whether it's a first year bird or an adult bird that you have in your yard. Um, so kind of a cool, just little feature. Um, they will come in if you have seed on the ground. Um, they are ground feeders. They're not going to go to, uh, they're not going to go to, uh, to feed in, in column feeders. Um, so just throw some seed on the ground and, and they'll stop by and, and gladly eat it. All right. So, um, I wanted to spend just a minute talking about identification because um, so many times you get something that comes through your yard and you're like, I just saw it for a minute and I don't know what it is, but I've never seen it before. Um, and I want to help you help yourself find it in the guidebook after it's left. 
um, because sometimes it can be hard. Um, so there's just a few little tips and tricks I want to share with you um, to help you kind of go through this process. What is the size and the shape of the bird? Is it a big bird? Is it a small bird? Um, and I know that that's all relative in, until you start comparing it to other birds in your yard. Um, so is it a warbler size bird? Is it a dove size bird? Is it a hawk size bird? Um, all of those things are really important. Um, and what is the shape of it? Is it small and plump? Is it really thin and kind of stands vertical? Does it stand horizontal? So if you saw it on a wire, is it more horizontal on the wire versus kind of standing up? Um, those are important features because birds um, all kind of sit in different ways uh, in different situations. Um, what is the color? Did you see color anywhere on the bird? Um, and I'll tell you, things to look for, um, did it have streaking on the head? Um, did it have an eye ring? So is the eye outlined with white feathers or um, does it have a, like a little teardrop like a female bluebird would have? Um, so little things that are maybe not an overall picture of the bird, but something that is unique about that bird that you could identify and remember. Um, look for that feature of that bird. Are they on the ground scratching? Because there's only a small group of the birds that we have up here that are going to be on the ground scratching. It's probably a sparrow uh, or a towhee. Um, is it uh, in a tree and it never sits still? It's completely moving every, every second of when you see it. We have kinglets, ruby crown, golden crown kinglets. They never sit still for more than a second. But that's a behavior that is unique to that type of bird. And then what habitat did you see them? Is, was it in your backyard? Uh, was it in downtown somewhere? Um, that habitat is important um, when you go back to say, well, I saw it here. Um, because a lot of birds have very specific habitat that they like to live in. Um, and um, if you live on the fringe of a pine forest or on the meadow or something like that, you're going to probably have a different group of birds um, than if you're in downtown Big Bear. Um, it just, it, it's their preference. Uh, so my last slide uh, is just understanding the silhouette. So when you see it, what does that silhouette look like? Um, there's a bird here that has a forked tail. Does anybody know the forked tail bird that we have up here in Big Bear? We did. It's not the cliff, but it is a swallow. It's a barn swallow. Yep, absolutely. So if you just happen to see a swallow flying around and it has a forked tail, by default, it's a barn swallow. We have no other bird here in the, in the valley that has a forked tail. So when you look at the silhouette, it's really important. Um, when you look up in the sky and you see swallows, they kind of have like a U shape. Their wings are kind of a U shape. And, and they're darting around. They're gliding around looking for insects. Well, we also have a swift here. We actually have two possibilities of swifts here. But our most common swift is the white-throated swift. But their wings are not that kind of U-circle. They kind of have these like little stubby, stick-out straight wings that they flap really fast. So just by seeing that silhouette, you're now able to deduct, hey, I saw a swift and not a swallow. And then, well, you know, with experience, you'll be able to say that was a box of swift or that was a white-throated swift. And there's key features that differentiate those as well. But understanding what that silhouette is, is really important and really key. Because you can now walk down the street and understand that, you know what, the acorn woodpeckers flap, 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 flap when they're going to a tree. But uh, there's other birds that'll flap, flap, glide, flap, flap, glide. So you start to be able to tell some of those behaviors simply by the silhouette of the bird. So I would encourage you to start paying attention to some of those things as you see birds that you know um, or that you can identify because then you can start to apply that to uh, birds that you don't know. And it will help you start to identify some of those unknown birds uh, that may be in your backyard.
again, thank you for joining us and come back and say hi. Um, good seeing you all. Thank you.